All right, well, thank you everybody for coming to um, Conversations on the Economy. This is the topic today is Restoring U.S. Competitiveness. This event is sponsored by the Toulouse Network for Information Technology. If you haven't heard of it, it's a very interesting academic research outfit. It's um, funded by Microsoft, but it's managed by the um, uh, France's University of Toulouse. And it's essentially, uh, the idea is to essentially get a group of academics together to study intensively the role of information technology and innovation and in economic growth. And that, of course, is highly relevant to the topic of today, which is competitiveness. Now, competitiveness is one of those cute, flexible terms that's actually been around for a long time. Uh, when my career began in journalism back in the 1980s, um, competitiveness was the hot topic. In fact, everybody used to swoon over the annual report of the World Economic Forum, the World Competitiveness Report. Every country, every leader from Singapore to Canada would sort of like, you know, open with sweaty hands the report to find out whether they were up or down that year. And it took about 10 years before the backlash began, you know, peaking with Paul Krugman's famous essay, um, Competitiveness, a Dangerous Obsession. And I think what came with that debate was the uh, realization that competitiveness means different things when you're talking about companies and countries. You know, companies compete, countries don't. You can have companies that are extremely successful, as America does, which are highly inv innovative, uh, you know, very profitable um, leaders uh, in their field, and yet uh, the country as a whole may not necessarily benefit from that. And I think that's part of the reason why this question is so relevant now, because the entire presidential election revolves around, I think, these profound economic puzzles about why a country that is so successful when you look at its leading brands and companies is struggling economically. The uh, median household income in real terms has actually fallen every year for the last three or four years. It's no higher today than it was in 1989 when we were first reading those world competitiveness reports. And even though Romney and Obama don't use the word competitiveness a lot, if you think about the things that they argue about, that's really what it comes down to. Um, you know, when Obama says we need to spend more on education, roads, and research, and green energy, he's talking about the need not just to promote those things in their own, um, uh, on their own merits, but to compete with China and the other countries that are doing the same. When Romney attacks Obama for not understanding how business works, what he's trying to say is that when you, deal, um, when you raise regulatory and tax burdens on business, you also read the, erode their ability and their incentive to, to invest and to innovate and to compete. So essentially, competitiveness, even though we may not call it that, is one of the central issues of the election campaign. And to talk about it today, we're very fortunate. We have three leading scholars uh, um, on various aspects of this issue, people whose research I've been following for many years, I think is very fascinating. Um, starting on my left is Doron Asimoglu. He's with uh, MIT, true renaissance man whose research has covered countless subjects from development and hu human capital to growth and innovation. Um, but he's most recently the author of Why Nations Fail, a uh, truly uh, sweeping and large <laughs> book that really does ask the question, what institutional factors determine which countries succeed and which fail? When the, econ when the economists reviewed it earlier this year, they basically summed up his answer to that question is some, some governments try to fail on purpose. So if, <laughs> that should really get you intrigued and get you reading that book. Next to him is Nick Bloom from um, Stanford University. Nick's main areas are in management and organization, but you may have heard him most recently because his work is being heavily cited in the area of policy uncertainty. In fact, Nick, I'd like to say that you've truly made it in public policy circles because you now have the distinction of both Republicans and Democrats have accused each other of taking your work out of context. Um, and on the far left is Josh Lerner from Harvard Business School. Um, I've actually, I actually remember quoting Josh's work when I was a cub reporter of the Wall Street Journal well over a decade ago writing about stock markets. Josh was and is one of the foremost experts uh, on the role of venture capital and innovation. He's written quite a few books on the subject, including his most recent one is The Architecture of Innovation. Um, so we're, before we launch into those things, I do want to mention that um, in keeping with the, uh, the setting, which is the Microsoft um, Innovation and Policy Center, we're going to be tweeting the proceeds. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. The handle is at Microsoft IPC, and the hashtag is uh, US Compete. So without further ado, we'll start with uh, Daron and hear his thoughts on the topic. Thanks very much, Greg. Thanks, for everybody. And thanks to the Toulouse Network and Microsoft. So I would like to make a few remarks uh, about the present and the future of the US economy based on uh, uh, my book with uh, James Robinson that Greg uh, kindly mentioned. Uh, the main idea of the book that, uh, uh, that James and I wrote is actually quite simple. Sustained economic growth uh, can only be built on innovation technological change and uh, investment in efficiency enhancing uh, 
uh, activities and organizational change. And what we call inclusive institutions, institutions that uh, <clears throat> protect property rights, harness the power of market, and more importantly, perhaps, also create a level playing field so that the majority of the citizens of a nation take part in economic activity are probably the only way of achieving this sort of uh, economic growth and, uh, and, and, and harnessing the power of the markets. But most societies throughout, soci uh, th throughout time and even today are not ruled by inclusive institutions, but extractive economic institutions. Those, as the name suggests, have been designed to enrich a small fraction of the society, the elite, politically powerful individuals and groups in society at the expense of the rest. And these extractive economic institutions don't protect uh, the uh, private property rights, don't allow efficient contracts, and create a very tilted playing field. Economic institutions don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, extractive economic institutions are typically supported by extractive political institutions that concentrate political power in the hands of the same elite and also don't uh, place uh, effective constraints on the exercise of that power. Inclusive economic institutions, on the other hand, are typically supported by inclusive political institutions that create political, political equality so that political power is broadly distributed and also put more effective constraint on the exercise of that power. Uh, inclusive institutions are also more flexible because they don't permit the uh, accumulation of political power. They create a greater flexibility, and in particular, when economic, social, and international conditions change, institutions adapt to take advantage of those. Uh, U.S. economic success throughout the ages has actually been built on inclusive, uh, inclusive economic and political institutions. Uh, you know, this is not to say that... Uh, U.S. institutions have been perfect. There have been times uh, where they have heavily relied on slavery until the Civil War, Jim Crow and other social arrangements until the civil rights area, and there have been episodic changes uh, in, uh, in institutions creating much greater economic and political power for uh, certain privileged groups. But on the whole, these institu uh, institutions in the United States have been comparatively inclusive. And if you look at the cru crucial period of US economic growth, for example, in the 19th century and early 20th century, they have been really leveraging these inclusive institutions. Uh, this growth were relied on industrialization and innovation. And this was made feasible by the fact that US had a very developed uh, human capital in society, so the sort of the level playing field in action there, had a very effective patent system, had a market system that enabled the businessmen and entrepreneurs to efficiently scale up, and also in the first place had a broader sort of uh, level playing field in the society that enabled these uh, entrepreneurs to get there in the first place. And you can see sort of the uh, 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 sort of signs of this. If you look at, for example, the people who have gotten uh, patents in the 19th century and have become leading entrepreneurs, very few of them are sons of uh, well-established families, large landowners, or very wealthy families. They are literally new men. But it's in the nature of inclusive institutions that they will be challenged. Because if you can uh, create a step away from inclusive to, uh, towards extractive institutions and tilt the playing field in the favor of some groups, then those groups are going to start benefiting from, uh, from that environment. And they will also increase potentially their political power. And there is a, there is a sort of a vicious circle there. And uh, there is, uh, in this context, perhaps uh, the history of Venice creates a cautionary tale that sort of tells the story quite, uh, quite aptly. Venice became one of the richest countries in the world in the 10th century based on broadly inclusive, for its time, economic and political institutions. Uh, its, ex uh, its political institutions were very uh, inclusive by, uh, by the standards of the time because they were essentially uh, characterized by the Great Assembly and the Ducal Council and also placed uh, fairly uh, severe constraints on how the the executive, the doge, could actually exercise that power. And you could see these inclusive economic institutions in action also because the Venetian uh, wealth was built on foreign trade, uh, uh, relying on very innovative ships, but also relying on institutional innovations. In particular, for instance, they created the commenda or other types of contractual arrangements that enabled people without capital but with ideas and entrepreneurial drive to enter into arrangements, risk-sharing arrangements, and uh, with, with people with capital in order sort of the uh, create joint ventures. Uh, 
Based on this, Venice became a, a, a powerhouse economically and, 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 and in the maritime trade. But this was not to last. In the, uh, starting in the 13th century, uh, the group of wealthy merchants uh, started monopolizing political power, in particular shutting off the ducal council to new men, uh, turning it into a hereditary institution, and shortly thereafter, uh, shutting off the uh, lucrative trade opportunities to new men. So trade, as well as politics, became monopolized. They went so far as to ban the commenda that was so important in the, uh, in the growth of, the, of, of Venice early on. So there is a risk that the US, in the middle of a perfect storm, with Venice as a sort of a uh, dangerous role model for it. And it's a perfect storm because I think there are a range of uh, factors that we need to watch out for. The first one is economic inequality. I economic inequality in the United States has been increasing quite sharply over the last 40 years. This is partly caused by skill bias, technological change, and globalization, but there is more to it. A very important factor is that US uh, supply of skill hasn't kept up with the demand. But there are also other uh, uh, forces at work. In particular, labor market institutions change in the United States quite sharply. Minimum wages are much less important. There is much less collective bargaining. And also the uh, norms of uh, 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 equality of pay and social norms of fairness in the labor market have been eroded, for better or worse, depending on your perspective. But that has been a contributing factor to inequality. Perhaps equally striking is the increase in inequality at the top. The top 1% uh, that accounted for about 10% of national income in the 1960s now accounts for almost a quarter of national income. And, uh, and this sort of uh, increase in inequality is dangerous for a variety of reasons. First of all, because economic inequality goes hand in hand with political inequality. It's very difficult to imagine a society in which the rich command so much of the resources and political power remains broadly distributed. But there's also another danger in that uh, this sort of economic inequality invites sort of the bad kind of populism, not the populism that sort of puts the interests of the uh, mass uh, ahead of those of the elite, but you know, uses the rhetoric of pitting the, the mass against the elite, but uses that in order to sort of create other groups of winners and other groups of elites. Uh, second, there is a very serious failure of our educational institutions. You know, US uh, prosperity, as I mentioned, was built on education. And throughout the early part of the 20th century, US educational institutions were among the best in the world and were the reason why we had a system in which a rising tide did lift all boats. But that sort of seems to have changed. It's actually quite striking. If you look at high school college completion rates and uh, high school graduation rates and college completion rates, for males, they are at the moment lower than what they were in the 1960s. And this becomes particularly jarring because the quality of high school seems to have declined quite a lot as well. A level playing field in a modern society cannot exist without a broad-based high-quality educational system, which the US is increasingly lacking. The third is money in politics. Because of changes in the technology of elections uh, related to the TV, and also because of changes in laws, the economic inequality that I have already mentioned has also meant that a lot of people have a lot of money in their hands in order to, uh, uh, to use in politics. And money plays a much bigger role in politics. And there is an increasing sort of uh, perception in the US, probably correct, that special interests are really coming to dominate politics. And only the very wealthy who can make big lobbying and campaign contributions have the ear of our politicians. And this sort of uh, coupled with the economic inequality trends really creates a, 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 a big, a major fault line. And, and it's fair to ask, for example, that is it a coincidence, uh, given this fault line, that when US has so high persistent inequality, such a failing educational system, poverty has become a social problem, still the thing that dominates the economic debate is whether taxes should be cut further on inheritances and the very rich. The fourth is influence in politics. And by this, I mean non-monetary influence in politics. And that's gone hand in hand with the role of money in politics, in that in a society where money becomes more important as a sign of social clout, the very wealthy also become influential through non-monetary means. And I think uh, you know, the best way of understanding, for example, the relationship between finance and politics in the United States is to take this into account also. Sure, finance does account for uh, 
almost 40% of corporate profits in the mid 2000s and finance did contribute a lot to campaign contributions. But really when you think about the real power of politics, the uh, real power of Wall Street uh, in, on politics, it doesn't come just from money but it comes from its uh, monopoly of expertise. And this is well illustrated for example when you look in the midst of the financial reform when Bernanke, uh, Paulson and Geithner and others uh, you know, in, when, 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 when times became tough, really turned to the very, uh, very leaders of, of Wall Street that, are, that were partly responsible for the financial crisis in the first place because they were the ones who had the expertise of getting the economy out of the place. The fifth is innovation and patents. You know, as I mentioned, patents have been very important in, uh, in U.S. growth. And they were very important because they're part of creating a level playing field. If you can uh, come into an area with a good idea and you can get a patent in order to secure your good idea, that's a contribution to the level playing field. But with changes, especially in some sectors, that, uh, that creates uh, kind of an environment in which large firms uh, hit on pools of patents and the process of patents and defense of patents has become highly sort of legalized, there's a danger that patents, especially in areas like software, are playing the opposite role, that they're, they're becoming a barrier against entrance, they're becoming a barrier against new, uh, new, uh, new, new technologies, so they're part of tilting the playing field, not, uh, not making it more even. And then the fourth one is uh, the war on terror. So that sounds like totally off uh, from the topic that we have here. You know, what, what has war on terror has uh, with the uh, U.S. economy? But I think it's got a lot. Uh, it's really almost impossible for a society that has inclusive economic and political institutions to make a big reversal unless its political institutions become extractive also. And the real danger in the United States is that with this influence in politics and money in politics, there will be a backlash that will start making the political institutions less inclusive and more extractive. And in such a process, it becomes really important that there is uh, dissent and free speech and, uh, and objections are allowed. But US politics has become domestically and internationally more militarized, less open to free speech and to dissent. And, 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 and partly this is based on sort of the threats that we face based uh, on the war on terror. And, uh, and 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 a variety of other things, and 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 and, this, and and here again, I can I cannot help but see some parallels with Venice. You know, Venice very famously did not have a police professional police force in the 10th street, uh, the 10th century or the 11th century. It only had a uh, introduced a professional police force when the uh, wealthy merchants shut off the rest and wanted to monopolize political power. And at that point, it had a, pl a professional police force that became increasingly repressive against people who wanted to have their voices heard. So this is a perfect storm, and I think it does spell some trouble, but I think there is also no need to become unduly pessimistic. This is not least because the US has been here before and has been able to bounce back during the civil rights era, during the progressive era, against as a backlash against the Gilded Age. And here, the flexibility of US institutions become really important. I think that flexibility and that openness to dissent and objections to what was going on was really central both for the civil rights movement and for the progressive and the populist movement that led to the presidencies of people like Te Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. And, and so I think all is not lost. But I think the important thing is that uh, we can be um, uh, optimistic but not, not complacent. So I believe that debating and thinking about the institutional foundations of our prosperity is no longer a luxury. So that's the last plug for this approach. Thank you for saying in 10 minutes what would take most people 30. <laughs> Nick, here's the, uh, you can uh, use that to move into your uh, you. slideshow. Um, so I guess I'm going to stand up. I feel slightly more comfortable standing. Um, it can, cannot have helped anyone's notice, escaping anyone's notice, that the last five years has been a horribly pessimistic from an economic perspective. We had the big recession, kind of failed recovery. Uh, the title of uh, this talk, Restoring U.S. Competitiveness, seems pretty pessimistic, too. I wanted, when I started, to point something out, which is, you know, things are not so bad. Uh, despite all the gloom, America is still the richest large country in the world. So you kind of get the perspective of the Americans are poor, things are going badly. Um, here are just some numbers. They're uh, GDP per capita. They're in 2010, they're per PPP numbers. They come from the IMF. And this is every country in the world that has more than 10 million, employee, uh, more than 10 million people and has more than $20,000 of GDP per year. And America is top. America is you know, 
not only top, it's uh, head and shoulders above the next country, the Netherlands. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but America is here in bold. The other country in bold is, of course, the other global superpower, the United <laughs> Kingdom, uh, my uh, homeland. And, you know, the, the Brits are about, you know, I, lived, I left Britain when I was about 35. The Brits are about 10, more than $10,000 per year poorer than the Americans. I saw this really obviously when I came over. So I came with my three kids and my wife. Uh, Americans have bigger cars, their houses are bigger, you know, the holidays are nicer, uh, the food is definitely better, you know, everything is improved. The, my, the anecdote that really brought this home is doing the usual immigrant thing, we went back after the first year back to see my parents and in-laws, and my daughter, after a day in London, asked me, why are the cars in London so small? And I said, you know, they're not small, they're just huge in America. So, you know, America is definitely rich. It's rich because it's, you know, linked to what Doron said, it historically has been good and had a century and a half of fast growth. But we face some problems. Um, I'm going to talk about one big short-run problem and then three uh, more long-run problems, which are linked very much to what Doron was talking about. So the big short-run problem is something that Greg and I've been talking to, and Greg's been covering a bit in The Economist, which is policy uncertainty. So what do I mean here? Well, I mean the fact that for businesses and consumers in the US, it's very hard to tell what's going to happen in the near future in terms of policy. Tax policy, regulation, monetary policy, things are in a constant state of flux. How do I know this? Well, um, this is a graph that I've been building with a co-author at Stanford, Scott Baker, and at Chicago, Steve Davis. It's on a website, www.policyuncertainty.com. What it does is it tries to measure economic policy uncertainty on a monthly basis going back to 1985. And we do this based on news coverage of policy uncertainty, um, the amount of tax code that's about to expire, and how much analysts disagree on government expenditure going forwards. What you see is it bounces up and down. Every time there's a war and an election, policy uncertainty goes up, drops back down. But recently, it's gone up to incredible levels. Policy is now just amazingly uncertain in the US particularly bad in August 2011 with the debt ceiling dispute, dropped back down again. And this, I think, is a big problem holding back the recovery. So why is that? Well, you know, if you're a business thinking about hiring or making an investment, the last thing you need is to be faced with massive policy uncertainty, which causes you to delay. And I think the best example of this was um, I was driving, in fact, driving my daughter to soccer uh, in, uh, well, I should say football, I guess, but in uh, Stanford uh, in California a few weeks back, and I heard a woman on the radio saying, look, she owned two Baskin and Robbins franchises, the guys that make ice cream, and uh, she was thinking of opening a third, but she decided to wait. And the reason was, uh, if the Affordable Care Act came in in 2014, she'd go from 40 to 60 employees adding the third franchise, would have to pay higher health care costs. But she said if that came in for sure, what she'd have done instead is opened a restaurant. She'd have had two franchises and a restaurant, separate business, keep her below the 50 minimum. But she said she'd rather open three franchises, but she didn't know whether the Affordable Care Act would pass or not because the Republicans and Democrats were fighting. So what was she doing now? Basically nothing. She was waiting to see what would happen. And she's kind of typical of the economy, that if everyone's uncertain, nobody does everything, and the, con the recovery never starts. And then what about three longer run risks? Well, two of them are going to overlap very similarly with Duron, uh, inequality in education. But the first one I want to highlight uh, is uh, Europe. So, uh, you know, Europe is a risk for the US. I see if Europe collapses, you know, the US gets risk sucked down with it. It's kind of like, you know, being the boat next to the Titanic as it goes down. And Europe has some serious problems. One of them is regulation. So this chart is uh, a chart from the World Bank Doing Business Index, and it ranks every country in the world on how easy it is to do business in them. And it's starting a business, getting permits, getting electricity, et cetera. Pretty basic rank. Number one is like, you know, capitalist paradise, Singapore. Uh, number two, you know, another kind of capitalist, uh, Nirvana, Hong Kong. The US is at number four. The US is basically an extremely nice place to run and start a business. The only downside, not surprisingly, the only place the US scores badly on is tax. The tax system is incredibly complicated. Otherwise, the US is pretty good. You scroll down, down, down. You keep going down, down some more. Uh, eventually, you end up at number 100. Right in the murky depths of the table is Greece. Uh, Greece is terrible. Greece is, has incredibly bureaucratic systems. It's very corrupt. My father-in-law has actually been living there for the last five years. When he bought his house five years ago, it cost about $150,000, and he basically paid for almost all of it in cash and, you know, in a plastic bag to avoid tax. He said it was very standard. Uh, at least he told me that. Anyway, so uh, 
You know, Greece is horribly overregulated, just as worryingly for me is look at its neighbors. At number 99, there's the Republic of Yemen, and 101 is Papua New Guinea, countries that don't inspire me as, you know, uh, places that you really want to be in the same neighborhood. So Europe is one, very overregulated. It's hard to start businesses in Greece. Secondly, it has too much government. So this is a map of the world where the countries are sized by the amount of government expenditure. And in the middle, there is this big, fat blob, which is basically Europe. Europe spends way too much money and, of course, has to either borrow or raise far too much taxes. So European growth is killed by heavy regulation and far too much government expenditure. And without cutting back on both of these, I really don't see sudden Europe recovering. And I frankly don't see them cutting back either. Um, so I'm pretty pessimistic on Europe. The second concern, very much linked with what Jerome was talking about, is inequality. So this is a graph that shows the percent of income going in black to the top 1%, in blue to the top 5 to 1%, and in red to the top 10 to 5% from 1930. And what you can see is certainly in black, there's a kind of a U shape. So if you go back to the 1910s and 1920s, the top 1%, so people that this year will be about, above about a third of a million, were earning a very large share of income. So who are these guys? Well. Um, they were the big corporate barons. So you have Henry Ford, uh, John Rockefeller, you know, Ford from cars, Rockefeller from oil. And in fact, does anyone recognize number three? No. no. Oh, sadly not. Stanford, Leyland Stanford. I thought, <laughs> I thought somebody had been doing their kid's college application at this point of year. Um, so Leyland Stanford, the railway baron. Those guys at the beginning of the century got fantastically rich. Their income was mainly from dividends from rich businesses. If you roll things forward, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, inequality very low, come forward in time to now, it's gone back up to the top 1% own 20% of income, and the thing is rising higher and higher. Who is earning that money now? Well, who are the super rich? They're a different group. They're Gordon Gecko types. You know, every economist, or at least many economists' favorite hero, uh, like investment banker, uh, hedge fund managers. That's one type. And then the other type turns out to be the super rich now, turn out to be media stars, entertainment stars, sports stars. I put Tiger Woods up here, who's a Stanford alumni. Uh, this photo was taken just before the scandal broke out, so you know exactly why he's smiling <laughs> on this. Um, you know, these people now are earning incredibly large shares of income. Why is this a problem? Well, the problem is that while the top 1% has grown rapidly, so over the last almost 20 years, their income's grown by 58%, the bottom 99% have basically not grown at all. They've grown on average by less than half a percent a year. So you have an economy where Americans are rich on average, that's great. They've had a long period on average of high growth, that's great. But over the last 20 years, the growth is all, almost all accrued to the top 1% and hardly any to the bottom 99%. Um, why is that an issue? Well, we live in a democracy, and people don't like this. Uh, here's you know, a, a picture from Occupy Wall Street. I, I am not you know, a supporter or fan of Occupy Wall Street, but you know, they hate us as much as they hate the rich. This is outside the American Economics Association meetings. They're protesting us. You know. If only we had the power to do anything about it, but at least, at least somebody thinks we do. Um, but I, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's a serious issue. And as Duran said, in a democracy, if, one, you know, if some tiny share get more and more of the money, you have a serious problem. And at the very least, taxes will go up rapidly. And there's some good in that, but you know, I'm concerned about taxes rising in terms of chilling growth. I think the much better solution is to try and get the 99% to incomes to grow faster. And how do we do that? I think education. And that leads on to my third concern. Uh, education is a pretty depressing uh, phenomenon in the US, really, really depressing. Um, the US, if you go back to 1950, led the world by a huge margin. We are rich now in large part because thankfully our, you know, our forefathers in the first half of the 20th century educated Americans, so they became much better educated than Europeans. But now that's disappeared. So here is a world table. This is from the OECD's PISA study. Uh, it's a very careful analysis. They test kids on, they test half a million kids across 65 countries using very carefully calibrated tests on, on reading, maths, et cetera. And the US uh, on reading is basically roughly bang in the middle of the OECD average, despite being the, ri the richest country in the world. Our reading, kids' reading is no better than average. Uh, and our maths were below average. You know, American maths is below average. Even more worryingly for me, look at the country above us, Iceland, the country whose banking system you know, <laughs> 
is based on the idea of 1 plus 1 equals 20. So, you know, this is, uh, this is pretty terrible. I have to say, with kids in public school, you know, I, my, I have two of my three kids who are in California in public schools. I was talking to Duran earlier. You know, they're okay, but by no means are they reflective of, a, of the world's leading economy. Um, but, you know, I believe in the U.S. It's very easy for politicians to say that. I personally mean it. I'm getting citizenship later this year. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, obviously I'm very happy living here. But why, why am I happy living here? Well, America's rich, and I think it has a number of obvious advantages. Americans are very hardworking. The British are pretty hardworking, but Americans work even longer hours. They're very entrepreneurial. I see that all the time with my students in Stanford, all the undergrads, MBAs. They, you know, they all want to start up their own firms. No one's interested in working for anyone else. Certainly not doing their coursework either. Um, <laughs> and free markets. Americans have a strong thing for free markets, which I think has been helpful. It has one other massive advantage, um, which is something I've been working on for about the last decade, which is world-class management. And what do I mean by this? Well, for about a decade, I've been working with a big international team, guys from Athens, Cambridge, Harvard, LSE, and McKinsey, to try and measure management practices across uh, firms and countries. And basically, you try and measure how much firms use monitoring, do they collect information, use it for continuous improvement, targets, are they motivating their employees, are they setting good targets and incentives, do they promote good performers, do they kick out underperformers. And we've sampled now over 10,000 firms across 20 countries. This is still ongoing. What do we find? Well, we find one pretty striking fact. American firms are, on average, the best managed in the world. And this is for manufacturing. For every, other private sectors we've looked at, it's pretty similar. Basically, Americans are tough but you know, effective managers. They collect data. They process data. They set tough targets. They rapidly promote good people. On average, they you know, reform or kick out underperformers. If you go down the league, you know, my own home country is in the middle. British management's not bad, but it's definitely not you know, world class. Towards the bottom, there's a bunch of developing countries. One question people often ask, by the way, is how come you know, China has bad management, but its manufacturing industry seems to be killing America? And the reason is basically wages. You know, mm -hmm. Americans are very well managed, but their employees cost 20-fold as much as Chinese. You can bet if you could pay an American worker the same wages you paid a Chinese worker, the flow of goods would reverse very rapidly. So you know, Americans are rich in part because they have great management. So I want to conclude uh, by saying, uh, if you're interested in following up any further, I have a couple of websites. One is worldmanagementsurvey.com, which goes through a lot of the management data we've been collecting. And then the other one, as Greg mentioned, is www.policyuncertainty.com. OK, thanks. Great. Pass it clear over to you. Great. Well, thanks so much for the nice introduction, as well as to the chance to um, do this. Um, like. Um, Darone, I'm guilty of having a book to flag. It's, <laughs> it only appeared last week. Um, but I guess there's a refreshing change to the others. I'm not going to be um, beating up on the 1%. It's just going to be, um, you know, this is really more thinking about the sort of micro aspect of um, innovation and how it works. But to sort of motivate us about getting excited about innovation, I probably don't need to do this, given the um, gloomy, gloomy tidings that Daron and Nick have shared with us, but we know the basic story, right? That this is CBO numbers. You know, they've got the extended baseline scenario that when you look at really the fine print, turns out to be the assumption that everything has to go perfectly right to meet those numbers. And then what they call the alternative fiscal scenario, which is with debt going to the sky, is pretty much the plausible assumptions based on where things, where things are going now. And that sort of concentrates the mind in terms of saying, how does one avoid this with natural you know, sort of solution one thinks of is if we grow, it really solves that problem. How do we grow? Well, the basic idea that we trot out and teach is that there's capital and labor and energy and various kinds of input. So you can certainly have more stuff you shove into that. And maybe in some places that works. So, you know. What the Greek Greek oboe players retiring at age 48 because it's hazardous um, hazardous employment. Um, you there you can say maybe we can sort of ex we can get a little more L input by just having people retire a little labor later in life and so forth. But for um, you know there, that's sort of a game you only can play for so far for so long, and that sort of leads us to sort of think more about this A thing, which is how do we get more out of the existing stuff we got. How are we more productive and more efficient on it? 
And you know, sort of going back to the 1950s, you know, lots of economists have argued that that A is really where the growth is all about, that getting, the, you know, getting more innovative in terms of you know, getting the same stuff and getting more out of it, whether through you know, hard innovation, technological innovation of new widgets and manufacturing things, or more the sort of management, the management stuff that Nick was alluding to, that that really accounts for the vast majority of growth that we've seen over the history of the um, history of the U.S. Well, how do you get innovations? I mean, I guess you know certainly you look at the United States and most countries in the world, the overwhelming amount of R&D and innovative spending takes place in the corporate corporate settings. That's sort of the primary place around the world. And we really see, you know, for the last half um, century or so, two dominant models that characterize the bulk of the funding. There's first the corporate R&D lab, and then second the more, you know, sort of focused, um, you know, startup startup company. Now, each of these are obviously, you know, models that have been developed and fine-tuned and have fabulous strengths, but they also have very real, very real limitations. So, you know, well. You know, corporate R&D lab is largely and remains, you know, largely a big company game. So even the most recent data, you know, essentially the companies with more than 25,000 employees account for the bulk of the R&D spending. And, you know, the basic idea is a very rational one. You say, we're going to get a bunch of smart people together, and we're going to basically make them, you know, sort of work on, you know, different backgrounds and perspectives. There'll be some sort of joint production thing that goes on, and there'll be the sort of serendipity and, you know, sort of sharing of ideas and so forth. Traditionally, the idea has been, you know, not paying, you know, people a huge amount of incentive compensation, saying you, you, do, the, you do the discoveries, but you don't want people having their sort of little turf thing, but getting this sort of broader, broader, broader output. The problem is that while there certainly are, you know, great success stories out there, there's also, you know, enough, um, you know, unhappy stories that one could point to in a variety of um, variety of realms. You know, one that I like is the um, Motorola story, where they, you know, it sort of really illustrates how, with the sort of best of intentions, you know, incent you know, that sort of theory of sort of doing this stuff can end up, you know, sort of going awry. And certainly, one of the one of the many peculiarities of Motorola was the their sort of real desire to incentivize people to go out and file patents. And in particular, they did a system where people got not only bon cash bonuses for getting patents, but they also had their badges that they would wear were color-coded based on the number of patents that were filed. Well, one of the end products was that the battery latch, in a four-year period, patents filed by Motorola on the battery latch that held the cell phone battery to the rest of a cell phone. There were over 50 filings on that alone. And, you know, essentially, you know, we, we know it's sort of a story where they did a lot of incremental stuff on their thing, but sort of really missed the whole sort of transition from, you know, the sort of cool razor phone kind of thing to the smartphone, which does more than just simply make, um, make, 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 make calls. So in recent years, there's been sort of a backlash against the sort of traditional model that characterized the post-World War II period, the, you know, the sort of central research lab and all that, more of a push towards divisional research, more trying to incentivize people, more trying to reach outside. And in some sense, you can say maybe this corrects some of the problems that research labs have. But I think it also raises some real questions. And I think it's fair to say that there's many questions sort of swirling around the sort of traditional model of a large corporate research lab today. The other model, we give credit to this man, George Dorio, who in many people regard as the sort of first venture capitalist and who introduced um, American research and development in the 1940s as essentially a model to fund young companies. And he had went through a process of sort of saying, why don't banks work? Why don't public markets work in terms of funding entrepreneurial companies? And saying that this venture capital model, which incidentally borrowed heavily from the uh, Venetian commendia, it basically took the partnership process. But instead of funding people to go out and drill oil wells or do sail ships across the, across the Pacific, was basically funding young companies, took that and applied it into this, uh, into this setting. And it seems to have worked, that there's considerable evidence that suggests that venture capital has been a very powerful way to spur, uh, to spur 
innovation. At the same time, clearly, especially today, we're seeing a lot of questions being raised about the venture capital model. And these have to do with where it works and how limited a place it seems to work, and also which industries it seems to work in. So this is the most recent data, 2010, I was able to put together. You know, what's clear is that if you look at venture worldwide, it still remains primarily a US game. Now you say, well, US is a big country. It's not a fair comparison. We can look at, we can put it as GDP per capita. We say, well, OK, it's not a US game. It's a US and Israeli game. You know, I think there's Hong Kong and Singapore here, which you have to regard with a fair amount of suspicion. A lot of people like to base their Chinese funds in, in, in Hong Kong because they've got a few things which are nice, like um, rule of law and a few other institutional <laughs> details. Um, but you know, so essentially, most of the world, the, you know, the, the volume of venture activity has been far, far, uh, far, far smaller. The other thing is when you look at returns, that essentially the returns, here I just did US and Europe, we don't have great data about other places, but it would probably look even grimmer. During the good years of the 1990s, US had huge returns, annual returns in terms of venture activity. Europe was come see, come sa. You get into the more recent period, it's been ugly here, but look at that, <coughs> minus 5%. You know, remember, these are annualized returns. So if you have a 10-year fund and you're losing 5% a year, that's truly impressive um, after uh, a number of years. The other point is that venture, while it's certainly generated really nice returns in certain areas, it certainly doesn't seem to have been a general, uh, general cure-all. Cure so essentially, this looks at the returns, venture capital from the early 90s till today. Um, it's sort of like as if you had held a portfolio that was just IT or just biotech or whatever. And the point is that the sort of software stuff ends up having vastly higher returns than anything else does. And in some sense, all the things, you know, many of the things that we might think that are really important, like medical stuff and energy and advanced materials and so forth, have had really miserable turn, returns. The model has not really worked good. So in any case, just to wrap up, what largely I do in the book is sort of pose this question of, is there a middle way? Is there a sort of way to combine some of the strengths of the corporate model, in particular, the deep pockets, the longer run time frames, the sort of staying power associated with it, and some of the incentives and innovation associated with the venture, the, vent, the high potential venture, uh, venture, venture model. And certainly, there does seem to be some interest today in terms of corporate venturing. It had been around in the late 90s, not largely abandoned, and since recovered. Now, you might say, is, are these kind of hybrids, do they really work? And I just put here an illustration of one of the worst product hybridizations I could come across, the <laughs> Harley Davidson white wine cooler, and all considered <laughs> match, and saying, can you really take these sort of two very different ways of doing things and end up with, with something that's better, or do you end up with just something that's suboptimal that has the, the worst of each? I think that when we actually look at the history of corporate venturing, despite the stop-start patterns and the fact that you know, many corporations have been rather schizophrenic about it, if we look at the actual performance of companies getting uh, corporate venture backing, it turns out to be surprisingly good. And that, in some sense, even though many of the initial programs were you know, somewhat naively set up and didn't really address and anticipate all the problems that were there, it seems this is a model that has uh, you know, he has a tremendous amount of power to it. Obviously, there's a lot, if you take this seriously, there's a lot of stuff that can be done on the public policy side. I think there's certainly also stuff that can be done on the industry side in terms of, um, in terms of encouraging hybrids. But I think at this point, I'll just sort of bring my thing to a close and throw it open for questions. Um, thanks a lot. Now I'm going to exercise the moderator's pr prerogative by asking for the first, maybe the second, third, and fourth questions because I have so many that I want to fire away at you guys. But Daron, I'm going to start with you because you you um, raised this very important issue of money and politics is perverting the role of our institutions. If I read you correctly, you're saying we benefited over the century from very inclusive institutions and they're becoming quite a bit less so. 
Um, but whenever I hear the complaints about money in politics and about the one percent and all that, I then look at what's actually gone on. You know, like if I'm a banker who's been putting all this money, you know, faithfully paying off my congressman all this time, I'm looking what I got from it. I got Dodd Frank, got the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I got Basel III, I got a president who you know who rips me to shreds every possible opportunity. The TVs go on. I got Elizabeth Warren, who's about to become my next senator, your next senator, and so forth. I look at government spending at the 24% of GDP highest. Uh, in the post-war period, I see new regulations in healthcare. I see uh, new regulations uh, on the environment and so on. So I sort of say, you know, I've been spending all this money to get government off my backs, and I don't think I've been getting my money's worth. So what, what am I missing here? If money in politics is so powerful and so exclusionary, why does it not seem to be, at least to a layman's eyes, achieving the nefarious ends that it's supposed to? Yeah, I mean, the way I would put it is that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, nothing is a guarantee, but 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 I think uh, uh, so. You know, given the sort of the problems that uh, you know the U.S. financial system had, something like Dodd Frank was probably inevitable. But I think the more important way that I would say is that I don't view generally, uh, although there might be some examples of this uh, in the recent past, but I don't view generally that what. Uh, you know, if you're a powerful business, what you want is to get the government off your back. What you want is the government working for you. And, uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, money in politics, for example, probably did play a role in the way that we got the Affordable, Health Care, uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, so, you know, uh, a lot of it was uh, designed and passed through uh, Senate committees run by former employees of the uh, uh, insurance industry. Uh, and the same thing, you know, you can probably point out in Dodd Frank or, or other things is, you know, a lot of power is left to is, is left up in the air about how it's going to be exercised. And, uh, and, and one can sort of argue about whether the way that uh, financial crisis was handled was uh, optimal and or, or it was sort of uh, uh, going a little soft on the uh, on the on the on the major banks. So so I think uh, uh, I think the fact that there has been an increase in sort of the government's involvement in the economy, and uh, I don't see that as uh, as sort of inconsistent with uh, uh, money and politics playing a role. So I think uh, what we have to watch out for, in particular, is that when you have inequality and money and politics go hand in hand you're going to have both uh, political inequality become more of a problem in the United States. I think we are experiencing that. But also, you're, you're risking the backlash. So think of Russia, for example. I think nobody would deny that in Russia, you had a totally botched privatization that was a total insider job and made millions of, uh, you know, billions of dollars for to totally ill uh, ill-gotten dollars for the oligarchs. But you know what did you end up with in Russia? You end up with Putin, who put the oligarchs down. So the same sort of uh, process that created the corruption in Russia in the privatization, especially the loans for, loans for share scheme, also paved the road for a sort of a Putin side uh, type sort of uh, uh, autocrat coming in and and, and sort of uh, doing a particular type of government intervention. And I think that's actually quite a bit of a problem in the United States in the sense that if, in fact, you think of the government not as a sort of a benevolent agent, but trying to sort of uh, do a variety of things, but subject to political uh, constraints, and you have a system where you know taxes don't have much room to go up without totally killing the economy. And there is inequality going on partly because of technological reasons or globalization reasons that are hard to reverse, partly for other institutional reasons that probably will not be fully reversed. You know, what can the government do in order to appease different groups? Well, it's going to use more and more of the government's ability to allocate non-market goods and try to take over more of the market goods in order to play more of this patronage role. So I actually would foresee that from a political economy point of view, you would expect the uh, US government to become to play more and more of a role, because that's the only margin left for playing politics in some sense. Interesting. So I suspect, Nick, you actually might have some sympathy with this, this view that the increased surge in regulation is a form of creating rents that can be then allocated by the government. But you would sort of see this as also a big dampener on economic growth and uh, innovation, right? Uh, yes. I mean, the, uh, and, you know, there's, I guess with the, there's Europe, which there's just too much regulation. So, uh, you know, the empirical fact is if you look across countries, regulation is basically bad for uh, 
bad for growth. I mean, you know, you don't want uh, unfettered uh, markets without any control, say, you know, uh, monopolists. You know, Stanford got very rich because he built the one railroad, railroad across the uh, Sierra Nevada and he made a lot of money, but eventually he wants some competition. But I think Europe is way too much regulated. The US has a more of a problem over uh, unpredictability. So we were talking earlier, but you know, one of the striking facts I was looking at, and there are various measures of this, but I, I was just reading this today, was uh, the National Journal looks, was looking at the US and it ranks uh, senators from a left to right wing scale. And if you looked in 1983 when it started doing this, it found 57 senators that were between the most right-wing Democrat and the most left-wing Republican, so a whole bunch of senators in the middle. If you looked in 2011, that had gone down to zero. So you have a very polarized system uh, where the government's trying to regulate, trying to introduce policies, but people have very different views. And unfortunately, right now, power is very balanced. So it's, you know, it's like uh, one of those movies where the good and the good guy and the bad guy fighting for the gun at the end is pretty evenly balanced. Now, it has a big impact which way it goes. And if you're, you know... The, the good guy or the bad guy? <laughs> <laughs> we discussed that as well. You know. <laughs> One way or another, the gun's going off. Um, you know, the combination of uh, balanced politics plus very polarized parties uh, plus governments wanting to do more is a pretty, pretty toxic cocktail now for generating policy uncertainty and slowing down uh, growth. Jo Josh, I sense that you were trying to jump in there. No, no, I'm, no, I'm more than willing to leave these guys to fight and decide no, who the good right, guy and the okay. bad guy is. But there's actually something, because Daron mentioned something with the patent system, and I actually wanted to bring right. you in on this, uh, Josh, right. because um, it's been a rough decade for the, anything in the innovative right. financing area. Venture right. capital flows have been low, as you pointed out quite well. Uh, returns have been low. Um, there's a couple of questions that I have, sort of like to what extent can you... Um, uh, blame that on the fact that like the financing system is all screwed up right now because we just had a financial crisis. Does that have a lasting impact? But the, the other is also the patent system, which has right. become much more of a high stakes game. There's a lot more right. money involved. We just had a patent reform, and I, my recollection is that the little guys all complain that they got shafted by the right. big guys because we now have a first to file instead of a first to create Right. system and, and so on. What are your thoughts on that? Has the patent system become corrupted and, and exclusionary? I mean, I think that certainly it's fair to say that the patent system has really suffered, and it's really suffered for two things, one of which is um, you know, some of the same issues that we highlighted here in terms of the policy process. You know, there's been this stalemate between the software companies on the one hand and the pharmaceutical companies on the other, and it's probably fair to say that in that kind of situation, the kinds of reforms that can get done end up being extremely incremental. I remember when we published our, uh, when we were writing our book on innovation and its discontents in 2003 about patent reform, we were really anxious that Congress was going to pass patent reform before our book, re book appeared and render our book mute. And essentially when they got around to it a decade later, you know, the changes were sort of so minimalistic that it really was... Uh, you know, very disappointing. The other aspect is just the courts and the workings of the system, which are really let, lent to various problems. The one thing I would disagree with Daron is he sort of characterized it as being a problem of large companies playing the game and really, um, you know, particularly with pooling and so forth. I would say this is a real case where the problems have largely been at least originated by many of the small, you know, patent entrepreneurs, the various kinds of um, non-practicing entities, and it's really only been in the last few years that we've seen, you know, sort of big companies deciding to emulate, rather than just being the targets of these um, NPEs, to go out and play the same, the same, the same game. But um, you know, it is a, you know, it's clearly a setting where you know what's supposed to be a sort of tool for allocating innovative rights has gotten, you know, messed up in a variety of ways, and reform seems to be exceedingly difficult. Do you want to uh, no, I, mean, I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, the problem started earlier, but I think it becomes much more severe when you know Apple makes its uh, you know merger and acquisition decisions on the basis of the you know what patents I can use in my next legal case. I think it's a bit like the healthcare system. I think part yeah. of the problem in the healthcare system is that a lot of the costs are not really de de related to healthcare delivery, but they're related to you know insurance uh, overheads and, and things like that, and that creates a deep inefficiency that's really difficult to. Reform, and I think exactly the same thing is happening in innovation. Now, an innovative company really needs to spend several dollars for every dollar of innovative activity on its lawyers, on 
sort of protecting itself on going and starting uh, court cases and getting advice and so on. And I think when the large companies that really are very important for you know innovation, for that's why I sort of singled out software there, uh, get into this game, I think the uh, allocative costs of this for innovation especially are very severe. Right. That, that would, in a way, you can say that what we've seen is that some of the most innovative companies in the United States, and certainly, you know, we can think about the, you know, Nortel deal or the or the um, Motorola deal and so forth, are ending up having to spend huge chunks of money acquiring patent portfolios from basically brain dead companies. Yeah. And you say that's exa we want the Apples and Microsofts and Googles to be develop spending their money developing new ideas, not rewarding people who have basically been there. But it's it's essentially the system makes it so it's necessary for people to go and, and do that. It's not just spending their money, also spending their energy. Right. I think that's what you, what becomes your key corporate focus, where your top people are working. I think that's the real danger. OK, um, I'd like to open it up to questions now. I believe we have two microphones, am I right? Um, so please put your hand up, wait for the microphone to come to you, uh, speak clearly, and give us your name and affiliation uh, before your question. Hi, John Backus, uh, New Atlantic Ventures, Venture Capital Fund, uh, also Stanford alumni. So I'm going to direct my first uh, question to Nick. Uh, the, uh, the analysis that you went through that I've seen a lot of times about the rich getting richer and the poor are falling behind seems a bit disingenuous to me. And I say that for, uh, for two reasons. One is there is incredible mobility between cohorts in the US. If you take a look at the quintiles of top quintile versus bottom quintile, over a 10-year period, half the people in the top drop down, half the people in the bottom move up. And I don't think that's captured in that static analysis. Second point on that is uh, I'm not sure it's a bad thing if the bottom quintile is not growing quickly, because I would bet if you did an analysis of the bottom two quintiles, most of those people are either transfer payment recipients people who are retired on Social Security, people who are on some type of other transfer payment welfare, and students getting their first job, which accounts for a lot of the upward mobility. So I think looking at it on a static analysis basis you know, loses what I think is a big part of America, which is the ability to sort of move from one bracket to another that is not as evident in other countries. Comments? Um, you, OK, so first off, you're exactly right. You want to care, you care about long-run income. So, uh, you know, that was uh, entirely from short, you, people making short run gains and losses. It's not such a big deal. You really care about long run income. One of the other worrying trends, I should say also, this isn't just a US phenomena. Uh, you see a very similar increase in inequality in the UK. You see it in most other Anglo Saxon countries. Interestingly, you don't see it in some of the European countries. So, you haven't seen it in France. And in fact, the picture is slightly more complicated because there's the top 1% where that's gone up a lot in you know, UK, US, Australia, and the top 1% hasn't in France. And then there's the rest. And within the rest, inequality is also going up. So you have a chart that you know, from the 50th percentile upwards, everything's blowing upwards in terms of income. And the top 1% is really rocketing up. Now, is that worrying? Well, you're right. There's a lot of income mobility across generations. It's not so worrying. Another disturbing trend is income mobility across generations seems to be trending down in the US and in many countries. And I think a lot of it's due to the increasing importance of education. So, you know, I see it with young kids. There's already a rat race to get your kids into the, you know, in New York, you hear the best kindergarten is the best early school, et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine that if you're in the bottom 25th percentile, it's very hard to ever get a hope of being up at the top. There are definitely people that make it, but, you know, they're increasingly fewer and further between. So um, why is it a problem? Intrinsic is not a problem per se. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not in favor of Occupy Wall Street. My concern is, um, that this system is kind of unstable and explosive. So you can imagine if you go on like this, you either get in the kind of South African situation where you have guys with armed guards and guns guarding the top 1%, or you have revolution, or you have very high tax rates. And you know some are better than others, but I don't really like any of those three scenarios. I don't think, for example, taxing the top 1% at incredibly high rates to redistribute is really sustainable. I think the best solution is trying to bring the bottom 99% up with them. And it seems pretty straight, and Duran mentioned it, technology is in is changing over time in a way that favors people that are educated. The economists call it skill based technical change. And the basic solution is try and educate the bottom 99%. And in fact, America is failing to do that. If anything, our education level is stagnating. We're not putting enough money into schools. They're you know, horribly regulated, unionized. There's a lot of problems with schools. Um, 
if you could bring up the bottom 99%, I'd be extremely happy to see the top 1% get richer and richer. Uh, the certain level of inequality is great. It motivates people. What's the optimal level is not clear. The fact is going up and up and up. You know, at some point, it just it causes serious problems. Daron, I saw oh, yeah. you. Uh, I think Daron wanted. I yeah, so you're shaking your head. Yeah, you wanted yeah, to comment. Yeah, I mean, that. I think the the view that you know U.S. is a highly mobile society is absolutely wrong. I mean, it's just absolutely wrong. There could be no doubt about it. Uh, it was you know the Tocqueville thought that was true. It may have been true when the Tocqueville was writing. The top one percent in the United States earned about six percent of national product, and the A day that we have from the 50s and the 1960s is pretty weak, but it suggests that we had the same sort of mobility as France or other European countries. Recent research by Miles Korak shows, and others have shows that US mobility has been going down severely. We are now much, much less mobile than Sweden, Norway, France, Germany, Canada. We're pretty much at the bottom of the OECD league in terms of mobility. In terms of who the median worker is, for example, you said the median worker, not his income not going up, perhaps is not such a big, bad, bad deal. The median worker in the United States is essentially sort of a, 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 a sort of 30-year-old, 35-year-old family head and has a, has a job you know, in the 1970s that would have been a manufacturing worker. And essentially what's happened is that a lot of these jobs have disappeared. And uh, part of the reason why the median family income is flat is because a lot of the jobs that were sort of the mainstay of, uh, of income growth for middle-income families have essentially d uh, dropped out. But they are not transfer income recipients. Absolutely far from it. Forty-seven percent. I would say, I mean, I struggle. Like, you, it's like a, you're between a rock and a hard place. I don't want inequality to go up and up and up. At the same time, eventually, you have to start to, you have to, start to, have to make sure the top 1% are getting all the money. You have to transfer it. So if we don't do something about it, tax will have to go up. I don't want to go down that road. I think the much better road. Tax is a terrible drag on growth and has all kinds of problems, as you all know. I'd much rather go around Route B, which is education. It boosts growth overall. and increase. It's just good, good. It's win-win. Growth goes up and inequality drops. And you know, it's just a question of putting in money and also reforming the school system. It's not just a case of finances. It's reforming schools so that they're more effective given the money they have. Uh, another question uh, right here. Yes, hello, Aditya Bhatnagar, AXA Advisors. Um, I have trouble understanding the complaints about the tax system because you have a company like General Electric that reports to its shareholders very good profits and then pays zero taxes. So w what is really the basis for you saying that the US tax system is a drag on competitiveness? Uh, <laughs> um. That, I, I don't normally have to do, uh, push against the U.S. tax system. Um, I, I mean, those, at first I'd say they come from the World Bank. So why does the World Bank complain against the U.S. tax system? I think the reason it complains about the, about the U.S. tax system is probably less the level and more the complexity and the uncertainty of it. So I personally notice this. In the U.K., I filed one tax return a year. Now in the U.S., I hire an accountant to do it. He files at least four a year. There's state and federal. There's AMT. I often file Massachusetts, Connecticut. If I earn my, you know, it's just mind-bogglingly complicated. And also, you don't know where your tax schedule is going to be next year. There's a year ago. It wasn't until December they decided stuff. And it affected me personally because I was actually doing some consulting. I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to get paid now or in January. So, you know, it's... The level isn't particularly bad. The U.S. is kind of mid-level in terms of tax rates. The problem with it is complication and uncertainty. So I don't disagree that companies should pay taxes. I don't know the details of GE. Maybe it should be paying more taxes. It probably made losses in the past. But in general, something that was transparent, simple, and predictable would be great. That's my concern with it. 
go back to what we were saying about the patent system, I'm sure there's a lot of money being spent on tax lawyers that might be better spent on, um, you know, people designing new, you know, turbines or something. Um, in fact, Josh, I'd actually like to get your view on this because the R&D tax credit is mm -hmm. one of those perpetual right. sources of uncertainty in the tax code. Right. Do you th see that as being a major barrier to innovation? And uh, Well, I mean, I think that certainly the way in which the R&D tax code has been the R&D tax credit has been implemented is not without its problems. In particular, you know, there's always been the sense that they don't want to reward people for doing research that they did, that they would have done anyway. The idea is to try to reward more incremental research. But obviously with the sort of nature of business where things tend to go up and down, you can end up in these sort of really very peculiar kind of situations where just like Nick's consulting project, you might say, let's not do that R&D this year, let's do it next year so we get the bigger step up in terms of it. And again, this has been an area that's been pretty fertile research for the public finance guys, but I think many of them would argue that if you really look at the bang for the buck, the additional R&D that gets done because of the tax credit, it ends up being quite marginal that a lot of what ends up being done is people taking advantage of the credit by doing various kinds of gaming of the, you know, gaming of the system. Are there more efficient ways to do it? I mean, if you had to find a way to take the uh, tax expenditures going on that, is there a better way to spur innovation than that, than that credit? Well, I mean, I think that first of all, I guess I'm, you know, certainly of the feeling that there's probably, you know, sort of trying to create the backdrop in the environment, which is one which is conducive for some of this stuff. And you can clearly think about areas like uh, technology transfer policy. You can think about, you know, various ways in terms of, you know, spending on really basic, basic R&D. Um, you can think about, you know, sort of some of the manpower things and sort of we talked a little bit earlier about some of the challenges facing, you know, growing companies and so forth. That there's a variety of things, but before you get into sort of fine tuning the, fine tuning the Tax startup idea. stuff, you know, just trying to get the environment from the patent code to, you know, the sort of entrepreneurial environment right probably makes a lot of sense. Um, another question. Uh, yes. Here. Hi, I'm Justin Hicks with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Um, fan of all three of your work and actually have it cited in an upcoming uh, paper in Economic Inquiry. So um, my question is going back to just thinking about the, the new growth model. Human capital, R&D are really bolstering growth in the economy. Um, you just mentioned it. Um, uh, Josh, the basic R&D, the federal government funds 60% of basic R&D. We're seeing that declining over time. And then the human, human capital question, how do you actually see us reframing these institutions to actually bolster long-term growth? Because if we're going to grow ourselves out of this problem, I see these are, as two critical uh, pieces of the pie that just really aren't coming to, together. I think you, you should take education, Nick, since you're the one who brought it up. How are we going to make? I mean, as, again, um, they're very much linked. You know, what's striking for me coming from, I was an undergrad at Cambridge. I did, you know, grad school at Oxford. I spent a lot of time in various UK higher education institutions. But coming and spending time out in Stanford and, you know, visiting Boston and Harvard and Matilo, it's very striking. Much of growth driv driving the US now, high tech, biotech, is coming ultimately out of universities. So a lot of basic research, you know, Silicon Valley is, you know, incredibly wealthy, is a large number of successful startups. These companies are paying, you know, a lot of, I guess, you know, the technology sector is funding uh, this room and this meeting today, and it strikes me that that ultimately comes from basic R&D and from education, particularly higher education. And putting more, it's not so much the elite sector that's a problem, but it's the flow of uh, high school graduates in. If I look at my undergraduate class in Stanford, it's increasingly foreign. Our grad students are about 70, 80% foreign. If you walk into the engineering school, uh, you know, you struggle to find a single American around. Uh, and why is that? Well, people aren't coming through the school system. And is that a problem? Well, I guess if the highly skilled migrants stay, that's great, but often they, you know, they leave the country. So I think a big problem is just the flow of people in. Uh, it's clear that basic R&D and, you know, education is driving growth just anecdotally. I mean, you don't kind of need to go much further than that. But one of the problems the conveyor belt of high school students into universities is slowed down. Yeah, another issue I'll just sort of throw in is that, you know, just the way in which science policy has been done in terms of thinking about this, perhaps 
it's not that different from most of policy in Washington, as we've heard, but you know, essentially is, you know, it's, it's very problematic. And we can point to a number of examples. One great example was the decision that was made um, early in the Bush years, right, to sort of really ramp up NIH spending. And there was this sort of tremendous exp exp acceleration of NIH spending. It was very wasteful in the sense that lots of the people went and put up new buildings and sort of really built up these things. And then at a certain point, interest in it peaked and it was basically flat for a number of years. And there have been a number of people who have looked and said, what would have happened instead of having this sort of crash NIH doubling followed by this plateau, it had just grown evenly and steadily at the rate it had grown before you know, of roughly you know, 3 or 4% in real terms and just continued for the next 10 years. And the answer is that it probably would have been much better off. And we can point to many other examples of this where decisions which are being made about basic research, even though it's a very long-run investment, end up being made in a very short-run, politically expedient kind of way, and the end results are quite problematic. Interesting. Um, other questions? Um, okay, I want to sort of finish. Oh, uh, one question over here, I guess. I'd just like to make a few comments. One, I, I look back at uh, history. Your name? Your, your name? My name is George DeVoe. I'm with Video Next, a software That's company. Right. I look back at 60 years of history, and Japan came into the global economy about that time, subsequently followed by India and China. There were no more Indians and China on the horizon. So it seemed to me that in the next five years, the income inequality that's created in the United States and Europe is going to somewhat disappear. It's going to be abated somewhat. Second thing I would make is a comment that Dr. Marshall Graham made about 20 years ago about the Internet, said that the existence of the internet would expand the number of geniuses in the available to the world by a factor of 10. So you folks wouldn't have to come to the United States anymore. Uh, and and it's, I think it's getting there. And I think that uh, equates a little bit to what we see in graduate schools of education here. The third thing I would, I would point out is that the NIH education, development of medical technology, we spend about $8,000 per capita on treating diseases and diagnosing diseases. The NIH spends about $100 per capita. I think that number could double to the level that the DOD spends on killing people. Good points. Anybody want to? <laughs> um, I, I guess I would just say that there are probably a few Brazilians, Nigerians, and others who will object to your statement that there's no more Indias and Chinas coming down the, uh, uh, down the pike. No, no, no Indians to come here. Right, exactly. What, I mean, I, I mean, it is fast. I mean, just just one really fast, one final observation I'll make, and then I'll shut up. Where it's just simply that you know, it is fascinating how, with all these arguments around death of distance, it seems like the focal power of places like Silicon Valley, New York, London, and so forth, if anything, seems to have become greater rather than less, and that's sort of intriguing to think about. Um, I'd like uh, Paul. Sorry. One question. Uh, Paul Page. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul Page. Paul Page from, oh, hello, Paul Page from CQ Roll Call. Um, Nick, I, I just wanted to go at, at one thing, and it's kind of to bring back what Greg started with, which is that your research is being misquoted by both sides or, or cited for their own reasons in bo uh, from both sides of the political spectrum. It seems to me that when you're saying uncertainty, as I read a lot of your, your papers, that I can often substitute the word risk. And so I wonder why, you know, that, that's an elemental part of business risk. And, and you told the story of the Baskin-Robbins franchisee, and just to bring it into Washington, to bring it to some of these lawmakers that, that Greg cited, what, what am I supposed to do as a lawmaker with that? What am I supposed to do for that person? Am I supposed to substitute the certainty of giving up my belief in affordable health care? for this person, or am I supposed to create a more certain environment and not do anything about a social ill that I think needs correcting? So, uh, key question. So, one is, it's just, I guess, about trying to avoid generating additional risk. Uh, you're right, I mean, Baskin-Robbins is the anecdote. Risk tends to chill investment and hiring. The last thing we need right now is having investment and hiring postponed. So. What's the policy response to it? Well, I think for an individual policymaker, it's very hard to deal with because basically the institutional system, and going back to where we started with Duran in the US, is generating big incentives for policymakers to polarize. 
this election has been, um, uh, you know, has been very much characterized as a get out the vote election, where the two groups appeal to their interest groups rather than the middle voters. And so there's incentives for everyone to polarize. Now, you know, the most amazing thing is that Romney's been castigated for his health care reforms in Massachusetts and tried to step back from what, you know, most people thought was a reasonably successful policy because it was seen as being too centrist. So there is, you know, an intrinsic problem in the U.S. political system that's forcing politicians to polarize combined with relatively balanced parties, you have political uncertainty and it's a big problem. What's the solution? Well, uh, maybe some kind of reform. You know, it sounds uh, sacrum, you know, sacrilege to say this, but maybe the, you know, the division of power wasn't as, you know, wasn't as, a, as good a thing as we think. I, I spent a year in the Treasury in the UK, you know, the a system that the Americans tried to get away from, <laughs> where they're trying to divide the powers up, and it had the downside that you had, uh, you know, more dictatorial powers. When I was there, I was under Gordon Brown, and he announced a whole load of reforms, you know, somewhat agog to Parliament, that he just announced them, stated, and they were voted on within the day they were done. But at least it gets around policy uncertainty. Now, there's some trade-off between <laughs> bad policy and uncertainty, and there's a graph, and you want to have, you want to be low on uncertainty and high on good policy, but there's a trade-off somewhere. And my sense is right now, unfortunately, America's within the frontier. Its policy is neither great nor certain. And, you know, you could certainly improve the situation by uh, trying to stabilize the policymaking process. How would you do that? I think you need more substantive political reform. You, need incent you know, politicians are super smart. They get it. You just need to incentivize. It's not that I think, you know, I'm not trying to say politicians are making mistakes. They react, as an economist, I think they're reacting to incentives. And incentives for each power to polarize and just, you know, to brinksmanship to the last minute. But the problem is the general public and the economy suffers. How you do that is a more serious political reform process, which I'm frankly not qualified to suggest, but I can at least highlight the problem. So I think we have time for perhaps um, one or two, one question more. OK. Um, you over there. I just I wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, Tom Henneberg, and uh, academically affiliated with Stanford, uh, currently working at uh, Boeing, the Boeing company, uh, and given a recent charter in our little startup organization to uh, help, the help the company figure out how to innovate in new uh, business models. Uh, we tend to, well, I'll leave it there. It's a challenge. Um, so I'm going to get away from the policy questions and ask Josh, uh, you kind of talked about this middle ground, this more, you, you showed the graph of, um, R&D spending by large companies still dominating, but that, of course, didn't affect or didn't talk about the effectiveness of said R&D spend. And then you went into showing how hybrid models between uh, corporate VC or corporate R&D and, and uh, true venture capital was more effective. And then you went in how to uh, encourage that model, but you didn't talk about it. My question is, what did that model look like that was effective? Because clearly it's not automatically or always effective. Right. What hybrid... Right. Uh, characteristics are effective, and can you give some examples? Absolutely. So we, this is a topic which we could go on for, for a good 30 minutes, and maybe we will, over drinks. <laughs> so I'll just give the Reader's Digest version now. But I think that certainly one of the most striking patterns you saw is that the most clear, clear thing, which sounds very simple, but is, ends up being sh violated shockingly often, is that companies who are investing in areas we have corporate venturing programs which are investing in areas that have nothing to do with what they're investing in. Think of you know, Exxon Enterprises during the 1970s oil boom, investing in typewriters and personal computers and so forth. That's clearly a recipe for disaster. Another thing that you can you know, very much highlight as being associated with success, and I'll stop after this point, is that there has to be a real effort to try to incorporate the learning back within the organization. A great example from the 99-2000 um, the boom was something called Cambridge Technology Partners, which was in, um, uh, in the um, Boston area, which was largely doing you know, a number of enterprise software kind of applications, a lot of which were very directly affected by the internet. They actually had a team of people doing internet investing out in Silicon Valley, and ended up being that team ended up being fabulously successful in picking some of the go-go companies of that era and generating very nice financial returns of it. 
Unfortunately, it was staffed by three guys who were completely out of, outside of the Cambridge Technology Partners organization that had no ties back to the guys in Cambridge. And as a result, while they had fabulous financial returns, there was none of the intellectual returns or any of the intellectual learning that led to that knowledge, which might have led to a course, course correction going on. But as I said, this is a, it's a fascinating topic for at least all three of us who find it interesting. And maybe we can discuss it over a glass of wine. Um, I think we're coming uh, to the end. I would actually like to ask one last question, which is that I'd like to ask each of you to offer one piece of advice to the next president on a way to get America more competitive again. And he only has time to read one tweet. <laughs> <laughs> start with you, Josh. Damn it. Um, can we start with Nick? He's sure. the ideas okay. man. Nick, go for it. Um, invade Canada. <laughs> no, uh, well. And the next tweet would be what? <laughs> Um, well, I, I, I mean, it strikes me the big single issue is, of all the things I care about most, is education. If you think of, when we talked, we came back to it earlier, inequality, growth, long-run prosperity, innovation, all of these rest on education. Uh, both as a parent but as an economist, I'm very frustrated with the state of the U.S. education system. And it's a combination, frankly, of money, put in more resources, taken out of defense. I mean, I just don't agree with spending vast amounts of money on defense. I mean, Britain's pretty militaristic, but you come to the U.S. and the money's even more. But also re reform the system. Uh, the fact that, you know, teachers that are turning up to school, well, reading things like the rubber room, you realize there needs to be more serious reform of the education system in terms of stronger incentives and training for good teachers and rewards, but also sanctions for people that frankly can't teach. So education, do something about the education system. The, the, I should say the, the current administration <laughs> has tried. I, you know, they, they have had pretty good marks. Arnie Duncan and Obama have pushed, you know, I don't want to say they've been bad, but more push in that direction uh, would definitely be good. That was a pretty long tweet. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a plug to um, Nick's stuff about policy uncertainty and saying that, well, you can imagine there's certain kind of legitimate policy uncertainty about people who really re who disagree about good ideas, but certainly you think about a lot of the things that go on and it seems to be uncertainty for its own sake or it seems to have no real, no real goal in mind. I mean, Nick took education. I would that would have been top of my list also. Uh, but I would mention two other things. I think the R and D. Uh, you know, I think U.S. government can do more to rationally encourage R and D. U.S. is still the R and D leader in the world, and that has a big impact on its own growth rate, on the world growth rate. And uh, we are very far from being where the government spends its resources optimally and gives the right sort of incentives for companies. And then the second is uh, the tax code, which Nick also mentioned. I mean, US tax code uh, is totally irrational, and that's an easy one to fix. R&D is, uh, is hard because, uh, you know, of course, if we can increase uh, the effectiveness of R&D by 1%, that would have a huge impact. But, uh, so there's an, a lot of uncertainty whether we could actually do that, whether if we increase subsidies to R&D, that will go to scientists without changing real outcomes. But it is quite obvious that the U.S. tax code can be changed, and that there were many good uh, ideas on the table, such as the Bull Simpson uh, Act, uh, the, the, the plan, and uh, and it's just a question of oops, it's just a finding the right political uh, will to do it. So that's an easy one. OK. Well, thanks very much. It's been a great discussion. I really appreciate your comments. Um, please join us afterwards next, uh, next door, where we have some um, uh, refreshments. And uh, Josh will give you personal advice on how to create the next uh, Google <laughs> in, a, in a corner of your office <laughs> and other great advice. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>